Channel, Smarter Manufacturing, an introduction to Bits List held um, on the 1st of October 2020. Thank you, Jafar. Uh, the speakers to introduce myself, my name is Sam Hume, the Partnership Development Leader for the Digital Manufacturing team here at NMIS. We have with us this morning, Mr. Tim Bittleston, the Managing Director of BitsList, and further, Mr. Jafar Juneja, who is the ERP theme lead here at NMIS, and um, I'll allow them to make um, their own introductions. Thank you. So a few housekeeping rules to run through this morning, ladies and gentlemen, very quickly. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel. Your microphones and webcams will be turned off during the session to avoid background noise. You can type your questions throughout the session via the chat tool. And we have both a chat box and also a Q&A function just to make you aware of them. Time will be allocated at the end for speakers to answer your questions. Further and throughout, um, we do invite um, uh, questions throughout the, the, the uh, presentation this morning, and um, we will be um, inviting you to turn your mics on and make con contributions when asked. Use the hashtag, hashtag Enmis Insights for any questions on Twitter at Enmis underscore group. And please take some time to complete our survey that will be sent after the webinar. Thank you. What is the National Manufacturing Institute Scotland? The National Manufacturing Institute Scotland is a group of industry-led manufacturing, research and development facilities where research, industry and the public sector work together to transform skills, productivity and innovation to attract investment and make Scotland a global leader in advanced manufacturing. Thank you. Enemis will increase productivity by reducing barriers to innovation, stimulate investment and increase manufacturing competitiveness, catalyze job creation and strengthen supply chain links, inspire and attract talent and equip current and future workforces with the skills they need and businesses need, and work with manufacturing businesses of all sizes in multiple sectors, providing benefits across the whole of Scotland. Thank you. Uh, NMIS is very much part of a One Scotland team operated by the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow, and supported by the Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, the Catapult, um, high value manufacturing catapult rather, Skills Development Scotland, Renfrewshire Council, and the Scottish Funding Council. Thank you. Um, the Enmis Group is a combination of core Enmis capability, specialist technology centers, and an active network of partners in the manufacturing community. In the yellow, we have um, the centers, the specialist centers, which are open now the Advanced Forming Research Centre and the Lightweight Manufacturing Centre. We'll see here in the purple. In development, we have a temporary workshop space and also our outreach efforts via our NMIS network. And finally, in the pistachio and teal, we have the core elements which will be opening in 2022, including a digital factory, a collaboration hub and a manufacturing skills academy. Thank you, Jafar. Um, and it's at this point that, it, um, with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce our first speaker this morning, the Managing Director of BitsList, Mr. Tim Bittleston. Thank you, Tim. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Give me the opportunity to go through a bit of the backstory behind uh, where we've got to with our project uh, to build a, a smart factory and some of the technology we've developed along the way and uh, hopefully uh, show you how you might be able to use either some of the philosophy behind developing your own technologies or potentially even some of the solutions that, that we've developed. Um, we started off uh, life, I, I, I left school at 16 and uh, went and worked for a small subcontract machine shop. And uh, within a few years, uh, out of necessity, had to start my own uh, subcontract machine shop if I wanted to stay in the game and uh, uh, started Bittleston Limited, which was a small uh, turn and mill uh, CNC parts manufacturer based in St Albans uh, in the southeast of England 
uh, a small picture of uh, my machine shop uh, about the age of 19. Uh, that's uh, a selection of the equipment that we'd crammed into what used to be an agricultural uh, cow shed down in St Albans uh, that was actually part of a scaffold yard. Uh, lots of learning being done at, at that age, a probably pretty naive uh, start in, in, in the machining business, but um, it grew very quickly. Um, lots of challenges associated with that. So you can imagine starting from, from zero um, over a five year period, investing uh, around a million pound in equipment and uh, meeting uh, head on without any prior experience, all of the problems that I've no doubt most of you will be fully aware of. <laughs> and, and have a great understanding of. Um, we started out in, in 2003 and uh, quite quickly realised that uh, one of the big uh, um, bottlenecks for us would be as we expanded, um, coming away from uh, pure you know, owner operation where uh, there was just two of us doing all the machining work, all the setting, doing all the invoices and all of those uh, other tasks associated with it to then having to manage teams of people who naturally are not quite as uh, enthusiastic about working as the people whose money it is that <laughs> they're trying to earn back. And uh, all, all, the, all the things that took us away from productive work started to uh, you know, make us think about where it was most appropriate to spend our money, um, automating or um, uh, things like this. We, 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 we bought two other companies, um, formed a, a small group of subcontractor companies that we then moved on to one site a little bit later on and um, <clears throat> that really was the, the the key then to saying look we need a joined up way of managing change we need a joined up way of giving instructions to people so they know what they're supposed to be doing all the time we need a joined up way to get materials in we can't really afford even as a firm of 10 uh, 12 that we ended up as uh, prior to selling the business to be doing an awful lot of administration work we wanted to be productive all of us productive making and uh, uh, you know shipping out good quality turn and mill components so uh, Jafar if you could give me the next slide please here a bit of a, a busy slide with lots of things on it but um, it, it goes over some of the problems that that we were facing um, paper-based or brain-based, we were trying to remember things like who we'd quoted uh, for what, for how much, uh, when we said we'd deliver things, you know, lo lots of stuff wasn't getting logged properly, lots of carbon copy forms and uh, things that we would have to then collate later on, delivery notes and invoices going into filing cabinets, all the things that, that, that we would have been used to back in the day. Um, and more and more so, paperwork uh, taking us away from making things, which was ultimately what was earning the money. Uh, the reason the business took off quickly is because we were good at making things and we were getting good stuff out the door and people were happy to pay for it. Um, when you're just doing paperwork, you're not, you're not doing any of that. And of course, more and more and more uh, of, of your job as a manager of a company like that becomes administrative, um, which takes possibly the best people you've got away from the productive work again. So um, the, the more staff we were taking on to, to try and relieve us of this pressure, um, really, the more pressure that we got. You know, we were coming away from doing anything productive more and more. 9001, our, when we uh, applied for our ISO 9001, it, it was a nightmare. The, the, we were not used to all of these things. We didn't really have experience. Uh, we didn't know what would be required of us, and we had to invent uh, as you well know, we had to invent all of these ways that we would comply with these uh, quality management systems and then try and apply them and then run with them and then iterate them. And we, we knew uh, after going through that exercise that there was a huge opportunity for us to turn this into a digital thing, uh, not to create paper forms and uh, uh, do all of these things on paper, but to actually, because we were starting from scratch and we had all the control, get in there and get all these things done digitally. If you could give me the next slide, please, Javar. So we had a, a really important untapped resource, which was uh, my dad, a, a distinguished career in computer science, uh, working for General Electric, Hearst Research, and then G. Marconi and Marconi Instruments uh, on computer programming. Uh, he had retrained as a, a minister in the United Reformed Church and retired from computer programming, which gave me 
access to an enormous computer coding resource. Um, understandably not available to a lot of SME businesses, but uh, if it's there, you should definitely milk it. Um, we got him to do some scripts for us uh, that would save us with, with simple uh, case, um, you know, one, one, one off case things that we went, well, it would be faster if. And we created a small system for logging orders, um, storing part data uh, programs and things like this. And that was written in a programming language that he had actually developed for this type of data uh, and communications uh, problem. So at that point, we started, uh, we didn't really know we were getting into a project, but we had started this project. We had started going down the road of building our own, certainly MRP system at the time, and then ultimately what it would turn into um, uh, quite a lot more than that, almost a full business system for uh, OEM type small medium enterprise I could have the next slide please so in 2009 we sold that business to uh, an oem crane builder in glasgow and uh, we had lots of input for the development of our systems uh, this was a completely different environment for us really we were now working as one of our own customers we were the the, the people doing the designing coming up with the parts that needed to be made, and then we were machining them as well. So we had this design engineering uh, uh, role that had been placed upon on top of the business that we had making widgets and parts that gave us great insight into what all of our customers must have been going through. So as much as we were having problems with all the administration and all the rest of it, our poor customers had to try and work out what it was they wanted to order, how many of them they needed when they wanted them by, uh, all of these questions. And this was a phenomenal opportunity for us from a systems point of view to start bringing in higher levels of organization. So uh, the complexity now, uh, the, what we had available to us to solve as a problem was uh, a full OEM business cycle from getting in a project specification to going through design, to going through any optimization, engineering, FEA, 3D CAD, all the data storage associated with that bill of materials and then to we had an opportunity then to turn that data into data that we could use throughout the manufacturing and then product life phases of uh, the equipment that we were producing could I have the next slide please so to do this our, our, our original systems were all land-based and uh, one of the things that uh, another consequence of uh, being in a larger group was that lots of things were being done across multiple different sites. So it made sense to us to, when we were making quite large adjustments to the systems that we've been developing, to look at getting this thing so it would work over the internet. Um, huge rewrite started to accommodate all of the things that we learned and specified from the new experiences we had inside of this OEM business and uh, we replaced our, our land-based approach with a, a web-based approach. The, it's an application, um, not a browser-based thing, but it uses the internet infrastructure to create wide area network uh, connectivity. So now we could operate on, on multiple sites with the same system with no special infrastructure, no, you know, with, without VPNs. Um, only internet connected PCs needed at any site. Um, site work, uh, as long as we had a mobile phone signal, we could connect tablets and get all our information, documentation, things from site. So, uh, you know, a, a big job. But it did turn into a big job because it took us about two years to rewrite the entire system to accommodate that. So, uh, and it was, a, it was a full on two years as well. There was a, an awful lot of hours doing it. But it left us with a different system. The experience of being in this much more, much broader business uh, was very valuable to us. Um, developed a system much like uh, the AFRC is using, using today. So <clears throat> one of the key things that we realized when we were rewriting our systems was that there was great potential for uh, AI, smart algorithms, et cetera, to work on the data that we were collating but that, that data needs to be organized in a sufficiently structured way for that to make sense. Now, we don't run many algorithms on our data at the moment. There's one key algorithm that's being run on data which converts design hierarchies into requirements. 
Um, and it's a great example of how that structured data has helped us. So the first uh, algorithm we have, it effectively looks at the design hierarchies, looks at projects that have been activated, looks at stock, looks at WIP, looks at project prioritization and allocates everything dynamically to um, the correct projects and then works out what you're short of, creates your shortages and then creates lists of things for inquiries and purchasing and for GR in. And that that is all an equation being run on structured data. Other equations will come along, other algorithms and other artificial intelligence and learning algorithms can come along and use the data in the same way. This data is connected in such a way that you can get an awful lot more insight out of it than you could if perhaps it was lots of separate forms and documents stored in a document management system or if it was uh, literally still a paper-based system just stored in folders on Windows PC for example. So the type of connectivity we have is based on things like projects being associated with people, equipment, materials and all of those things in a way where if you were trawling it with a smart algorithm or some deep learning or artificial intelligence, it would be able to make those connections, work out perhaps that a person needed to be contacted because something minor was going on that it had anticipated would cause major problems to their particular project, for example. And a, a great deal of work has been done on connecting more and more of that data up. If I could have the next slide, please. One of those things has been uh, a problem that we've all probably faced with, with email and uh, things being sent to people that should perhaps have been made available to more people than they had been. Um, again, to connect that data, to make it relevant, to get uh, other algorithms working on it, bring in messaging in application that was contextualized so that people could talk about specific components, materials, customers, people, training records, skills matrices, and that the messaging actually was open to everybody who was interested in that. So you could go back onto a part, for example, and see the message thread about all of the different things that have happened to that part, all of the different engineering change requests that have been made and all of those sorts of things. To get that into the same system, to get it connected with all of the documentation, revision control and everything was a, a, a key objective. And again, all running through the whole project, a theme of trying to bring all of the things we do so that they're connected together, um, either as a, as a data construct or through the graphic user interface and the data construct. If I could have the, the next slide, please. So the next bit of this for us is, um, can we connect multiple organizations or multiple people using our systems together in the same way whilst retaining IP security for them? And the solution that we've come up with um, and that we are developing to date is that there is limited, uh, purposefully limited connectivity between um, different instances of the systems that we're running where suppliers and customers, for example, can allow certain things to be linked across multiple systems using uh, this dot bits file type that we have. Development work we're doing on it at the moment, we're starting to uh, lay down the the foundations for uh, permissions to be granted by other uh, systems implementations to allow people from other organizations access to specific documentation so that if you you could revise a document from outside of that organization if that had been deemed proper and that those uh, documents would then be available to all of those people with the revision history with the correct identification for the people so they effectively have unique user identification across all of the different implementations of the system that we have. Um, at the moment, these things are, are read only, but what you can do is you can take a, a dot bits file, give it to a supplier. If you revise the drawing up, the dot bits file will have the revised drawing in it. So even if they had it on a, an email from six months ago, um, they can open it up. If you made a revision that morning, it will say there's a revision on this document that's been made this morning by this person. Um, if you store these documents in your document management system or in your Windows folders or anything like that, then the data that you retrieve when you open them is relevant and controlled on a bits list system somewhere. Again, to do with connecting data up in such a way that um, the data structures allow us to see where these things are relevant. I'd have the next slide, please. 
So things that are available, simple document management, some connectivity, uh, again, associated with this uh, one use case that we had, we would have people changing documentation for manufactured components, whether that was customers or our own design team. And then we would have people in the shop floor potentially picking up old drawings or running old CNC programs and not seeing the fact that these had been up revised, even if it had been made visually obvious. So we added using this connectivity here, we've added the um, a security layer where if a document is modified, the associated documents that are on the same record, so CNC programs or anything like that, will flag red immediately and tell you that the main drawing has had revision made on it. And it will give you an option to align it so you can open the main drawing, look at it and go, this doesn't affect my CNC program. Or you can open it and look and say this fundamentally does and make a revision to your CNC program. But it will communicate the fact that something's changed to the person out on the shop floor who's doing the job. And it's a simple traffic light system. So a red document, it can't be read unless you go to the revision history, then it will tell you why it's been outmoded. It will tell you that the main document's been changed. Amber documents are ones that are aligned and green documents are ones that have been signed off by multiple people as being good. Uh, nice and simple, easy for people to understand. Uh, good use of the fact that these pieces of information are connected all over the system. We'd have the next slide, please. Oh. So now we've, uh, we've entered an exciting partnership with the AFRC and, and NMS where we are sharing um, a lot of the uh, experience that we've had building these systems up over the years and uh, hoping to uh, enable people to develop solutions along the same types of lines and to use our tools where they're appropriate, to identify where our tools are appropriate and to identify where they might be able to use the fundamental principles associated with the construction of our tools to develop new uh, solutions to other problems and integrate with our tools and other people's tools to develop um, good solutions for specific case, uh, case by case um, requirements. Um, we're uh, quite interested in, in, in building up a little bit of a, a um, more connectivity with our equipment now. So we're starting to collect sensor data from things and working out how that fits into our uh, MRP environment. Um, what sorts of pieces of information are interesting to collect from the shop floor and how can we compare that with the type of data that we've got in our own systems? For example, is our schedule accurate? Are the things happening on our schedule in the time that we anticipated they would be happening on our schedule? What is it that's causing schedule slip or what is it that's causing us to be in front? In, in, in front? Um, we're building a, a series of uh, sensor kits uh, that enable legacy equipment and things to be connected in the same way as machinery that comes uh, with, with MT Connect or OPC UA can be connected to certain dashboards, for example, um, because we've got lots of legacy equipment too, um, just to connect machinery that's capable of MT Connect communication wouldn't help us very much. It would, it, it would be a small percentage of our equipment. So we're looking at things to try and broaden um, the amount of information that we can collect from the shop floor and then ways of understanding that data in context with our MRP and our actual manufacturing requirements. Um, hardware installation uh, is progressing at our exemplar uh, at our manufacturing facility. And uh, we'll soon have some interesting uh, additional capability. For example, uh, we're going to bring all of our work to lists directly to machines so that people can see what those machines should be doing next. We're going to be ensuring that programs are immediately available from the machine uh, and that you'll know which programs you should be loading and which revisions they should have been based on the documentation that we've got in the main design system. So using that connectivity of data, again, the structures of the data to make sure people are getting the right thing at the right time. And at the same time, uh, watching AFRC's implementation and the advancement of that and ensuring that we are learning from uh, the additional input that they're giving us so that our Solutions are appropriate across more different environments. I can have the next slide, please. So where, where are we going? Um, we're really keen to build a, a, a full smart factory exemplar that SMEs can come and look around, decide what technologies they would like to take away. We would love to be able to share 
our experiences and be involved in building a, a next generation of digital manufacturing engineer, people who understand the fundamental principles and can apply digital uh, tools um, to solve engineering manufacturing problems uh, in the same way as we would be taught to um, apply uh, physical tools. Um, I think there's a huge general, you know, there's a, there's a huge problem we've had in the past few years with, with the education system not cottoning on to the fact that digital skills are becoming as important as general math skills, things like that. There's a gap to fill there. Uh, we need our workforce to understand that there are a whole heap load of new tools that can take them away from sitting in front of computers and filling in spreadsheets and get them back onto productive work, get them back onto, you know, exciting developing uh, solutions etc and that we, we really want our facility to be that kind of enabling empowering place where people can can come and learn these things and that for us that's the resonance we have with the national manufacturing institute for scotland and the new resume uh, resource efficient manufacturing supply chain environment uh, test bed that's being produced as well because it's very much in alignment with the type of thing that we would like to achieve in our own factory so uh, thank you very much Can have the uh, next slide now, John, please. And um, thank you very much, Tim, for that clear, concise and illuminating contribution, um, highlighting the value of the digital solution that you've developed in BitsList yourselves and um, how it can benefit SMEs um, in enabling digital supply chains, not only in supporting them, strengthening and buttressing them, but also um, how, how the BitsList software can um, uh, lend itself to, to greater levels of accountability, transparency and control within an organisation. Um, I should note as well that, 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 that your point about um, developing digital skills is very much um, something that, that the NMIS is looking to, to address and co-address with yourselves through the establishment of the um, Skills Academy, which will be launching in 2022. So, um, Right now, I would like to introduce our next speaker, speaker Mr. Jafar Juneja, who is the ERP theme lead for NMIS and the AFRC, and he will be um, describing how activity um, in this area um, um, can support both, both SMEs and industry more widely and more broadly. Thank you, Jafar. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining this webinar. Um, just to provide an update as to where we are with the deployment of uh, BitsList. So at the moment, we're almost fully rolled out um, at the AFRC. And uh, by the end of the year, we'll be you know, fully rolled out um, at the LMC as well. Um, and as Sam mentioned, the digital factory isn't physically up. But once that's in place, um, we'll be looking at rolling out BitsList in there as well. Um, but, um, you know, in terms of... The benefits of bits list, um, one of the key ones due to COVID, uh, maybe we didn't appreciate that as much was that it's a cloud-based system, um, which means, you know, you don't need to create, uh, sorry, be connected onto a network, as Tim mentioned earlier. Um, you can, all, all you need is a simple internet connection and you're onto the system where you can load, load jobs for, for, for the technicians to, to carry out. So that's been um, a great feature uh, for us and uh, it's it's been also really easy to deploy um, bits uh, within the AFRC um, for anyone who's looking into a system like this what I would advise is to have your data uh, data sets um, you know structured uh, in 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 advance of the implementation and what I mean is like having your human resources, capital resources, um, all your inventory related data, um, have it structured way in advance. So when it comes to deploying, everything is rare and there and ready to go. Um, and it was really, really, really simple to, to get bits going within the AFRC. Of course, you know, you don't, you do need to have some sort of processes in place. Um, you know, in cases where you're struggling with processes, BitsList has a unique way of driving processes because everything is done digitally. Um, it kind of forces people to do things in a certain way. So that's been uh, great for us as well. And also getting digital signatures 
in terms of signing off jobs. Um, you can imagine with a paper-based system, uh, things can get lost um, on the shop floor um, or duplicated, and it just creates additional, um, you know, wastes within the shop floor that, that you can avoid using a system like, like BitsList. And as I mentioned, yeah, it encourages a paperless environment, which is, which is great, especially if you're if you're looking into you know digitizing your shop floor. And one key area for us is improved traceability. Um, you know, with the labs that we have um, within the AFRC, we have uh, we need to go through a strict auditing and procedures such as you know ISO 17025 or ISO 9001. Um, and BITSIS definitely assists, it makes it easier uh, when it comes to auditing. And you're able to trace, you know, your materials from the moment it arrives with all the documents, all the way, you know, through processing, manufacturing, and to the moment it leaves the building, you're able to trace um, all the way through. Um, so some of the paperless, you know, going paperless, what, what can you benefit from that? Um, for those of you who, who are familiar with the lean methodologies, you will understand what these seven points here are. And these are the seven kind of common waste that you find on the shop floor. Um, and having a system such as Bitsless can, you know, help you kind of reduce some of these wastes, um, particularly around the admin, you know, type of tasks that Tim mentioned early on. Um, and probably one of the one one of the worst wastes um, is overproduction, because that you know includes every other waste that you see down here. You know from having to use inventory that you could use on on a different job, um, unne unnecessary motion, over processing, uh, waiting for materials, quality defects, you know, transportation um, of materials around your shop floor. So these are all things that you can reduce with having a system such as bitsless um, in place on your shop floor um, and what that does that it unlocks unused creativity within your within your workforce and that unused creativity can be used um, on an industry for or digitization related projects such as resume um, so this is a test bed that the uh, nms is working on um, it's looking at, or it's, focus is, it's focusing on um, getting shop floor data all the way to the top floor. So how do we get, you know, data from our machines all the way into a system such as BitsList and other system that, that, that we're using, like, you know, Dynamics or a PLM system? Um, you know, there's a lot of useful data there that I think um, a lot of manufacturing facilities aren't tapping into. So. Um, the test bed will be focusing on getting that data from our machines and and how can we find better insights you know how can we um, understand when a machine is about to fail so it's about you know not working harder working smarter instead and it's not about preventive maintenance but instead it's about predictive maintenance so before something goes wrong you're able to find out and uh, what can you do to, you know, fix that issue before your uh, machine completely dies on you? So on your little, very left-hand side here, you can see the ISA 95 structure. So there's five different levels. So as I mentioned, going all the way to your equipment on the shop floor, obviously you will have uh, machines that are, you know, that have some form of connectivity and other machines that don't. So we refer to those bit of equipment as legacy equipment. So how can you add things like sensors to enable some form of connectivity there and getting that data and sending it to the different levels such as you know your SCADA or your MES or your ERP system. So these are these are the kind of um, areas that, that we're focusing on um, with resume. And with that, you know, there, there come there comes its own type of challenges. You have multi-vendor systems. So how do we get each one of these different systems talking to each other? Um, you know, simplifying value extraction um, and also making the, the test bit flexible enough so that, you know, solution providers can plug in their solutions to show showcase what, what, what their solutions are, are capable of doing. And also for solution adopters to come in and taste that, test out those solutions. 
So it needs to work both ways. Um, we'll also be deploying 5G. Um, you know, there's a lot in the news um, around 5G. So there's there's been a bit of a delay, um, but you know, it's an unproven technology um, just in general with, consu with consumer base, but also in manufacturing it's something that's not been tested before so that's that's a challenge for us to to focus on um, and one that you know most people will be familiar with is that there's no standard field bus and you know there's different protocols and all, all these kind of things um, that, that you know we need to take into consideration um, on the test bed um, so this is basically just a map of, you know, what we expect uh, to get out of uh, the testbed. So as Tim mentioned, you know, you can have multiple facilities that, that are running, you know, uh, an instance of bitsless or maybe uh, a different type of ERP system or any other t uh, system uh, that you may have in place. But it's all about, you know, connected the, connecting these systems together and getting them to talk to each other. So for instance, you might get, you know, demand coming through um, our NMIS uh, facility and what we would like to get to is that you know across the different facilities we want to determine where is um, the best location to manufacture a product based on capacity and lead time to deliver that job to to the customer um, how can we use you know our supply chain partners also um, to, to deliver that product on time. Um, another area, uh, a focus area is that, um, you know, getting our ERP system connected to our PLM systems also and connect and creating a digital twin of the product. Um, so where you, you want to get to a stage where, you know, once your product goes out to the field, you're getting data out from the field and feeding that data back into the into the digital twin and that maybe creates new opportunities in itself um, a new business model where you know you can you can track a customer's product and see you know when is it about to fail and maybe you can communicate that with with your customer and, and let them know in advance um, of the failure um, so these are just some of the opportunities um, that resume will present um, but um, I would like to bring my presentation to an end here, but also welcome anyone that's, you know, interested in this test bed or would like to get involved um, in, in, in the test bed here to become a, either a supply chain partner or just to find out a little bit more about it. Um, so, yeah, please feel free to get, get in touch with us. Our contact details are here and uh, would like to welcome any, any questions that, that you may have. Um, and thank you very much, Jafar. I think you've just anticipated my first question, which was how can people get involved? Um, so by connecting with yourselves, um, I suppose. Just, just, just firstly, I'd just like to ask you a very quick question that we've had. Presumably, the um, the resume um, architecture is going to provide the the foundation for the digital factory, which will be opening in 2022. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So, yeah. It, it's basically the foundation. We have a lot, a lot more other test beds that other teams are working on, but yeah, this sets the foundation to, to allow you know other test beds to to carry on other types of work from from here on. And um, thank thank you very much. And as you'd said, um, ladies and gentlemen, it will be five G enabled, so there are um, many opportunities to explore in that respect as well. Um, th I'd like to thank you both for your contributions um, this afternoon. Um, whilst, whilst you were speaking, we've had a number of comments and also questions. And forgive me, so I'll try and get everybody's names um, pronounced them correctly here. But we had a comment from a Mr. Jim Cardinal, um, who's been working in high quality electronics and optics, um, and was suggesting that, 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 that he was interested in becoming more involved in manufacturing and um, innovations in general. So I think that that was um, in response to your um, contribution there, Tim. So it was just really Really a, a, a thank you and just say how interesting it was to learn and develop an appreciation of innovations. There was then a comment made 
by a Mr. Um, Peter McToll, who had thanked you for your contribution and had made a comment in and around the continually um, evolving nature of bits list. And um, I was wondering if perhaps you could speak to that for a moment. Yes, uh, thank you, Peter. Yeah, we, 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 we have got a lot of work to do, obviously. Uh, <laughs> there are millions and millions of problems out there. So mm -hmm. you've got millions and millions of potential ways you can go. I think uh, a lot of what we've done where we've had to, to, to row back and think when we've been developing our systems is that a, a lot of this is about the philosophy of solving problems and uh, development of toolkits that you can redeploy. Um, what the user sees potentially, the, the, the graphic part of the system is far less important than the way that you've actually constructed it and the ability to be able to add new things to solve specific problems and then row back on them when you realize there's a better way of solving it. Um, normally that comes of, about through understanding the, the way that something is related to something else. That's a, it's a key thing. You, you, you build complexity into a system and then you realize that there's a, 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 a relationship between two fundamentally uh, separate pieces of data that you have sitting separate silos in the system that you can exploit to reduce the complexity of the system again. So that uh, philosophy is trying, you know, that's been the thing that's enabled us to continue to, to, to develop this thing to a useful level. It's been a case of, okay, we're starting to learn now how you solve these problems, the process you go through to understand how you specify code and deploy um, reasonably quickly um, ways of, of, of dealing with problems. And then how you, without causing too much disruption, uh, may improve on that um, uh, and, and allow your systems to, to continue to change. And I, I know, um, uh, for example, uh, pieces of work we're doing at the moment that are, are, are really, you know, centered around a, a requirement from AFRC uh, for a, a, a particular database for some information that they wanted to store that, that looks quite disconnected from some of the other things we're doing has turned into a, using that philosophy, turned into a project where we're, we're almost certainly going to be able to use the solution all over the place. Um, we've been developing a thing that allows you to create your own uh, digital forms that then automatically collates them. So you don't have to re-enter that data anywhere else. And if you don't know how to use uh, all of the macro programming available in Excel, no problem. We've got a system here where you can add a whole heap load of things that you need to record in a form, for example, a dimensional record report or a, um, a material test or something like that. You can lay instructions into the form as if it was a sort of web page, for example. And then you can go through and you can check boxes and write comments and choose from drop downs. And that's automatically collated into a spreadsheet format that you can then export to create all of your reporting and things from at the end of a time period. So you can go back to it after a year and check it and go back to it after two years and you'll always get the same output, which will be all the additional data will be in there. And the, the, the tools we've used to do that have been tools we've had made available to us over uh, from solving other problems and that, that those sorts of jobs, they're, they're, they're quite quick, they're quite cheap, they're quite effective because we're actually structuring the way that we uh, make the tools available carefully. And that, 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 that really has been the biggest learning thing for us has been look at it from the point of view as you're building a toolkit and the skills you need to be able to solve any problem that could be solved by digital. And then look at each of those problems on a case by case basis. Don't try and fix the whole world all at once uh, because you just won't manage it. And don't try and fix something that's so isolated that the next thing you try and fix has to be a completely separate set of tools because you will never get the things to join together and try and use the same approaches or develop approaches that are um, universal to solving those types of problems. I think that really does give you a system that you can continuously evolve without causing too much user disruption. Thank you. Um, uh, and thank you very much, Tim. So uh, you'd anticipated my, my, my next question really, or sorry, or the next question which we'd receive from the audience, which is um, in and around um, how, how the the system which you've developed, um, the bespoke system, highlights broadly the value of developing a um, an approach or a methodology to, uh, for digital solutions. So thank you for addressing that. And I'm sure that the, um, 
uh, perhaps you're going to be very well placed to advise um, other organisations and SMEs who face some um, similar issues. Um, one of the other questions which we've received as well, which was um, in and around a comment that you just made um, about adoption and embedding the, the bits list system within an organisation in practical terms, um, how, how difficult or how, how easy rather um, is that? This is a, 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 from a technological point of view, I think all of these things are pretty easy these days. The, the problem you've got is, is change management and culture. Um, these are your, 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 your big problem is culture. Um, people have ways of doing things. I think all digital uh, technology, you, you can separate into to, to, to what are fundamentally tools, the same as a, a hammer would be. Um, those things tend to be quite popular. So if you if you create a, a messaging app, uh, all it does is it allows you to send messages between one person and another. And there are plenty of them. They're still popular because they have each one has a different USP, something good about it that you would go, oh, that would suit me. And, and it's a tool. It's not telling you how to run your organization or how to live your life or something like that. It's, it's seen as an isolated tool. Those things are quite easy culturally. You can get them straight into an organisation. This isn't a problem. No one, no one listening will have a problem with trying someone else's cutting tool solution if they've been told it may give them a better uh, return on investment than the one that they're using currently. You can always drop it and go back to the one you were using before if it didn't work. <laughs> Systems that are you know, across your organisation that are trying to connect all of your data together, they are... Well, they're quite technically easy to implement. You know, we can have we could have a hundred people running on a system uh, that we've put in in a day without any problem. It takes two minutes to install it on your computer. The idea of actually getting all your people to play ball, to use the same systems, to use the same uh, ways and means of doing things, to actually use document management on there, to revise the drawings on there, to store all of their programs on there, to do all of these things. That is a much harder challenge for people to, um, to, to broach. You have to be committed. Um, I understand that that also is, a, that's always been a worry for us. Uh, a lot of the time, I think, you know, you've got big players now that are going to put systems out there that people will be encouraged to use by, if they're working in large organizations, you've got your Microsofts and your Googles and your Amazons giving you all sorts of capability. They don't know what your problems are. You are the ones that know what your problems are. And ultimately we've got a, a, we've got a big skills gap. We've got a, a problem with people not being able to do the things they need to do at a fundamental engineering principles level. Um, I don't think that um, bits list is a hundred percent solution to everything everybody wants to do. It's been developed for an OEM manufacturing organization, a small one with a hundred and odd people working in it that designs things, builds things, buys things and makes things, assembles things, paints things, does wiring and electrical and ships things out the door. And it's being adapted to uh, function inside of a smart research facility as well, where people are doing testing and running projects. And you know there are differences between the two, the, the two places. The approach we have means that it's reasonably easy for us to tailor what we're doing to what other people would require. However, I don't think that's the thing that we should be selling. I think the thing we want to sell is the experience of actually building our own product, the things that tripped us up, the things that, um, uh, that we got right, and where we think we've got to from a philosophy point of view, what, what's important about it, what types of skills you'd need in your organisation, to be able to tailor things to do exactly what you want them to do inside of your organization. I think that's the, the key thing with this. I mean, probably initially I naively thought well, there might be a saleable product in this, but let's face it, if Microsoft and all of these people don't have what you would consider to be a mainstream ERP or manufacturing business IoT solution yet, it's probably because they haven't worked out how to do it either. And if they can't work out how to do it, um, Maybe we, maybe we have got the advantage of being coal-faced guys that are actually cutting metal, and that stands for something. But it probably means that the market is incredibly difficult, and that everybody has got different problems and different mm. ways of tackling them, and that it's very difficult to find people who want to be told 
how to fix something. Um, we have specific ways of doing things. They might all be compliant. We might fly through audits. It might be really easy for us. I might not have to do any engineering management anymore. I can just press buttons and people make all the stuff for me and I can sit doing webinars. But that's not necessarily what everybody else is going to want. <laughs> Uh, or, or, or it's certainly not going to be the way, way they wanted to implement it. So it's, um, I think, uh, you know, people can get involved, people can get in touch, we can show them how the systems work. And if it fits the bill, then they can take the systems, it's not a problem. But I think the biggest contribution we can make, certainly uh, in line with uh, NMES and with the, the, the test beds and everything is to describe our philosophy to describe the toolkits that we've developed under the bonnet and to get guys learning how to use them, to get some guys who can program in low level languages like C, to get some guys who can see a problem, a manufacturing problem and know which tools to use to fix it from a digital point of view. Um, that's gonna be our input. That will be the thing I think that uh, we can really help with because the journey we've been on has equipped us with a lot of these tools now. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, um... Indeed, indeed. So conferring the benefits of your experience for those on similar journeys. Um, thank you very much for, for highlighting the responsiveness and the, um, the tailor, or sorry, the fact that you can tailor um, um, the, 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 the software, etc. To, um, to need. So um, I would imagine that you'll be receiving a number of inquiries, really, because it sounds as if you're very well positioned to be providing advice there. So um, thank you very much indeed. And um, moving on, Jafar, we've received a couple of um, questions um, here, two main ones, really. The first really was um, talking about involvement. So um, you'd, um, you'd kindly introduce the resume um, testbed and you'd noted that it will be uh, providing the architecture for a digital factory in the future. I suppose um, the, the question here was, was just about how can organizations become involved and if they don't have anything that they think that they can contribute materially to resume um, will they be able to to the digital factory yeah absolutely um, so um, you know getting involved doesn't mean you know having to contribute something materially it's just making your facility available within the supply chain that we're aiming to build as part of um, resume um, so it's all about you know finding partners that we can connect to, um, and uh, it's not just about you know having bits, instances of bits list, but I'm sure there are other systems out there. So how can we connect to those also? Um, and that's what Resume aims to do is to to show that you know it's not just one or two systems out there. There's a lot more, and the challenge is is that how do we get all of those talking to each other um, to you know. That way, you know, uh, your customer and your suppliers are all kind of talking to each other without having to, you know, pick up the phone and chase up your supplier or, you know, the customer calling you, you know, to see where their products are. Um, so that's the level of connectivity you would like to get to. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see, you know, any materials contributions required to be part of resume um, or, on the supply chain. Sorry, and th and thank you very much. So at the moment, it's very much just an area whereby um, we're acting. Uh, sorry, we're going to be providing an area whereby companies can test their ideas and products. Yes. Thank you. Um, the next question that that that, that we'd had um, spoke to the predictive maintenance element of um, of of your presentation, where you were saying that essentially, um, what 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 the uh, what, what what bits list is facilitating and what the systems architecture that that, that that we're developing will facilitate is the ability to um yeah predictively maintain assets etc and i was wondering if you could speak speak to that yeah absolutely and i think uh, there's a feature within bits list where you know you can add in uh, maintenance tasks and obviously whenever you know these occur you would like to know how that impacts your schedule. Um, at the moment, that's managed manually, but with that also, you know, when you, when you when you're getting your your data from your machines, it would be nice to get that type of data going into your ERP system, where you can, you know, in advance, 
of the machine going down, you are able to um, predict that machine going down and um, do some maintenance work in advance of it completely going down. So all this data feeding into each other and feeding into your, your scheduling system to see what kind of impact does it have on delivering um, your products to the customer. Um, and also, you know, that's just one use case. When you're getting a lot of data from, from your machines, the, it probably opens the door to a lot more things that probably we're not even aware of just now. So until you start collecting that data and uh, analyzing it, um, you'll, be, you'll be able to, um, you know, get your hands on a lot better projects than what I've mentioned just now. But the first key step is, you know, get that data, get that data and, and start, you know, visualizing that data to see what, what it's doing. Um, you might be running multiple shift patterns, maybe shift A works better than shift B. And it's all about, you know, getting to the root cause of understanding why shift A is working better than shift B. You might have an experienced staff, so that exposes, you know, your need to retrain your, your, your staff to maybe work in a better way. Maybe processes are get, are, are, aren't getting followed. So, you know, data is key here. Uh, make sure you're getting your hands on it, enabling your machines to get that data and uh, um, analyzing that data to, to improve your, your manufacturing um, um, facilities. Thank you very much. And um, just one question from myself to end, um, if you don't mind. It was, um, uh, as I understand it, you've been responsible for um, embedding bits list within a number of different projects and test beds um, throughout NMIS. Um, and you've just been speaking about how they, it facilitates or has facilitated um, more effective um, communication with real time updates, et cetera. I was just wondering if you could speak very briefly to the, um, the practical benefits that, that, that you've noticed. Yeah, so within the AFRC, um, before we deployed Bitsless, it was really paper-based. So we had, um, you know, forms and, uh, you know, people that, that, that would fill these forms out on, on a Word document. Um, they would upload it onto a SharePoint system um, that wouldn't really um, notify the relevant parties that, you know, there's a, there's a, a job available for them to, to work on. Um, so as you can see, everything kind of worked in silos. And uh, what Bits this is helping us do is that it's making those jobs available to anyone that's able to operate a bit of equipment. So there's a skills matrix feature within Bitslist where you can um, um, assign people to machines. And uh, when you're creating your, your, your job card, uh, the job card basically you're selecting what material you're using and uh, what bits of equipment that will carry out um, that work in order for you to manufacture that part. So once you set up your skills matrix, the system then does the rest of the work for you. Um, you don't need to physically approach a technician to carry out your work. As long as a technician is logged into the system, they have a work to list there for them. So you can see how it's already, we're already kind of reaping the benefits of, of you know, connecting people through bits list. Um, and even if people are looking for updates as to how their, their job is progressing on the shop floor, it's not about going to the technician and speaking to them. It's about now logging into Bitslist and tracking your job. Um, it's similar to, you know, when you're ordering a pizza on Domino's, you're able to track exactly where your, your, your pizza is, you know, is it in the oven? Is it getting checked for quality or is it out for delivery? It's the same thing with Bitslist. It lets you see that, you know, kind of information um, and it saves everyone time at the end of the day, yeah. And thank you very much, Jafar. I think that might be a wonderful analogy to end on. So, um, uh, but, but but also I think that it's one that that, that really does demonstrate the um, the transparency which the system provides. So, um, I'd like to thank you very much for your answers there and your contributions. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that this has brought us to the end of today's presentation. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Tim Bifflston and. Uh, 
Mr. Jafar Janaja respectively for their contributions. We have their email um, addresses here on screen and I'm sure that they both will work, welcome questions in and around any of that which was discussed this morning and further um, if you would like to develop a, um, a greater appreciation or receive more information in and around how um, the, the test beds um, which NMIS is, is developing can benefit um, your organizations and how you could become involved. And also if you'd like to learn more about the BitsList software. So thank you very much, um, Jafar and Tim. I'd also like to thank, uh, sorry, take this opportunity to thank the um, marketing team here, Debbie and Laura for arranging um, the, these wonderful series of events and for keeping us all in order this morning. And finally, um, to yourself, ladies and gentlemen for your participation and attendance this morning um, we look forward to seeing you at the next NMIS um, in, uh, event thank you very much Laura thank you Sam that's great yes as Sam just mentioned there um, the next in our series of NMIS insights online is next week on Wednesday and it's entitled cracking the code uh, Python for data analytics so this is a follow-up from our uh, first Python webinar that we had earlier on in the year. Um, so we hope you can join us then. Um, and if not, have a look on our website and you'll find out about the other webinars which might be of interest. Okay, so thanks very much, guys. I'm just going to close down the meeting here. Um, and that's it, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Bye.